Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me in the locker room on this Friday, May 12th. I'm Alan Locker. My guest today, Constance McCashin, is here to look back at her career as an actress and tell us about the incredible work she is currently doing as a licensed independent clinical social worker. May, or as Constance says, every month is Mental Health Awareness Month. Constance rose to fame at an early age on the Howdy Doody show, but her parents squashed her early career so she could have a normal childhood. 25 years later, she was living in that famous cul-de-sac on the CBS primetime series, Knott's Landing, where she played fan favorite Laura Avery for nine years. She also spent two seasons on Brooklyn Bridge. After days on the set of Brooklyn Bridge, she got her master's in psychology in the evenings. She relocated to Boston, Massachusetts, where she obtained a master's in social work from Simmons College. From there, she went on to work in the counseling center at Brandeis University while simultaneously teaching in their theater department. The melding of those two worlds has resulted in a skill set she could not have planned for. It is truly my pleasure to welcome Constance McCashin to the locker room. Hi, Constance. <laughs> First of all, I did not have a normal childhood, even though they took me <laughs> off. Because those two clowns that I lived with, no, that unfortunately did not work out. There was something else you said that made me laugh. Let me see. <laughs> oh, I had to sleep with the producer and director of Brooklyn Bridge to get the part, my husband, Sam Weissman. <laughs> well, that, that, <laughs> what else did you say that was funny that made me laugh? Yeah, I, I love that. Oh, Love that. yes. Well, my background as an actress and teaching acting at Brandeis while I was kind of edging my way into the counseling center. You know, a lot of actors enter the mental health profession. A lot of them become, I mean, a lot. I mean, I can't tell you the numbers, but I have several friends who have been actors, successful actors, who also segued into that. And Marsha Cross, who was on Desperate Housewives, already had her PhD in psychology. So... I don't it, think it's that odd a segue. It, 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 it's interesting because as you were saying that, I've interviewed a lot of people who haven't not ne who have not necessarily gone into the profession, but they studied it, like you said, Marsha did previously. Many they, actors they have had a lot of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> we all have done that. Can't hurt. Can't hurt. Well. You moved to New York City right after college and have said that in between working behind the belt counter at Saks Fifth Avenue oh, and on the stage, you found God. therapy. Well, I have to tell you the way I found therapy. I don't know if you know who Larry Moss is. Larry Moss is a really well-known acting teacher and now a very well-known coach, very respected coach. I was in Larry's first acting class ever, ever. And I saw Larry for lunch in New York on, on Sunday. And I said, to, I, <laughs> I said to him, I said, Larry, you told me in class, well, number one, you said I was either, you, oh God, this is so awful. I reminded you of a nun or a glazed ham. This is what he said to me. <laughs> and then he said, you know, you really should go into therapy. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, you mean it shows? So we talked about this on Sunday. I went to his therapist, which was probably not quite kosher that I went to Larry's, my acting teacher's therapist. But then ultimately I found, a, I was like 23, 24, you know, and I, I found this wonderful therapist in New York who was also an analyst. He was such a kind, kind man. I wish he'd moved in with me the day I was born with that normal childhood, you know, that normal <laughs> But anyway, and Larry and I were laughing because he claims that I said to him, Okay, Larry, I'm going to give you two years to teach me how to act. And then if you don't, I'm going to become a nun. Where he got this idea, I have no idea. But anyway, he was a phenomenal teacher. He still is. He is Leonardo's coach on all his movies. Oh, who? who? Leonardo who? Leonardo. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he really gave me a gift. He, he, he gave me a skill that as an English major from a Catholic girls school, I did not have. Yeah, so an English major, but going to New York and finding Larry's class, where did your love of theater start? I danced in the summer in musicals. I couldn't sing, but I could dance in Connecticut. And I, I came to New York and I was very, as they used to say, Alan, you're very P and G. You know what that means? 
no. Procter and Gamble. I was yeah. very white and kind of boring. So I got a lot of commercials, a lot of commercials. And that sustained me other than being a cocktail waitress, a chauffeur and selling those focaccia belts at Saks Fifth Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot believe that was the other thing you said. I thought, oh my God. The so, belts? The belt at Saks. I cannot <laughs> believe it. Oh, Lord. Um, you know, so while working in Hollywood, you, you successfully earned your master's in psychology. You know, what pushed you in that direction? Was it Larry pushing you into therapy? Like where did? <laughs> well, I knew as I got older, I either, if I was going to keep working until I dropped dead, I either had to become a Supreme Court justice. And I did go to law school for one year during the OJ trial. That was exciting, but I hated it, hated it. Or I could become a therapist where the older you get, the more credibility you have. People walk in the room and they think, well, she's so friggin' old. She must know what she's talking about. They don't know that you just got your degree five minutes ago. <laughs> and you can do it until you drop dead in the chair and your patients will keep talking and you'll be dead and they won't know it and everybody will be happy. So there you go. <laughs> For those that don't know, how would you describe psychotherapy? Psycho, emphasis on psycho. <laughs> and, and why do you believe therapy or mental health conversations today are still so stigmatized? You know, all kidding aside, that is ridiculous at this point. I mean, I, 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 you know, living in the Northeast, you and I, we're a little more acclimated to the idea of therapy. But you don't have to go far, especially in certain cultures, to find out that a lot of people are embarrassed, ashamed, uh, find it stigmatizing, do not want you to air the family dirty laundry in a room with a stranger <laughs> that you've never met before behind a closed door. I think I see a lot of kids, a lot of high school kids, college kids, 20s, 30s. That's most of my clientele. And some of them are from really diverse backgrounds. And even though their family's insurance is paying for their sessions, they're not really very supportive. But I guess, I guess for some reason they think, okay, well, nothing else is working. So why don't we just give this a shot? And, um, you know, it's, it, especially with the rise in anxiety among adolescent girls, you've probably seen this in the New York times and Washington post and everybody blames the pandemic, Alan, but really when the cell phone, was invented in 2007. That's when we started to lose our adolescents and our college kids because they started to lose the art of conversation. They started losing the art of connecting. You know, some of, I, this is pathetic, but some of the kids I see, this is really, the 45 minutes with me is the highlight of their week because they can be themselves and nobody is judging them and nobody is bullying them and nobody is flinching and, but you know, it's, it's a sad commentary. I mean, I am so thankful I did not grow up in the social media age. Uh, forget it, forget uh, it. Yeah, it, it, it's very difficult. And it's interesting because you, you talk about us being on the East and, and being more open to therapy. And yeah, absolutely, I've been to therapy, um, but I do know people still here who, you know, just don't believe or don't think it's right for them. And they definitely can benefit. And, wow. and then I even think back and, and wish it was offered, you know, my parents were Holocaust survivors. Wow. And I, I think what, you know, therapy could have done to help deal with that trauma back then for wow. all Holocaust survivors, not just my parents, you know, it's, it's, it should be a, uh, you know, well offered, a medical practice for people who need it. Right, right. You know, that's an interesting sidebar that the, the progeny of Holocaust survivors are, and this has been written about more recently, and I think it's probably borne out to be true that there's something called inherited trauma. I don't want to get into that with you right now because that's obviously very personal, but that's an, but that's an interesting, you know, that's an in interesting adjunct to what we're talking about because inherited trauma not only because your grandparents or your parents were Holocaust survivors, but any sort of trauma that your parents or your grandparents suffered 
can in, indirectly affect you, but that's a whole different conversation. Yeah, absolutely. If someone watching was thinking about going to therapy, what would be the first um, suggestion you give them to find the right one? You know, right now it is so difficult to find a mental health professional. I and mean, I live in Boston, which is the, the medical mecca of the world. And New York is too. But Boston, because of the universities here and the hospitals here, I, you know, the, I, we have the best psych hospital in the world. Well, one of the two best in the country, that's for sure. But getting in to see these people is a, a second career. So you may have these people in the community, but you don't have access to them without tremendous effort. And I guess the best thing is to start with your insurance company. If you have insurance, they can give you referrals. The other thing is, you know, these online sites, some of them I don't think are as reputable as others. So I'm not quite sure um, what the good ones are because there's a whole thing with licensure and potential lawsuits and it's, it's complicated. It's really, I mean, I can't see anybody who's not physically in Massachusetts. So don't tell me your troubles now, Alan, while we're on this. Thing. <laughs> I won't. I promise. I, I can be anywhere. I can be in Paris as long as the client that I'm Zooming with, well, it's not Zoom, it's a HIPAA compliant platform, is in Massachusetts. When my kids that I see in high school go off to college, I can't see them if they're in New York or Pennsylvania, which is pathetic because they're going through this enormous life change and they can't find someone on campus because all those campus counseling centers are understaffed. Now they farm the kids out into the community if they can find somebody. It's a very broken system still. So finding a good therapist, um, I was gonna say something off color, but I won't. Ooh, 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 I have to be so careful. Um, <laughs> We, we don't have we don't have those CBS sensors here. Well, you know that expression, who do you have to blank around here to get yeah, a good yeah. coffee? Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> it's just really, really hard. And unless you, even if you know somebody, it doesn't matter. They don't have room. They have wait lists. They have, they just, there's just not enough time in the day. And I see, I have 55 patients. I see 30 to 35 a week. And I don't, I work half day on Fridays. That's why we're having this meeting to this meeting, <laughs> whatever this is. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't work weekends. Some people do that. Forget that. Um, yeah. I don't work Friday afternoon or Monday morning. Cause I go away a lot. And even with that, I see 30, 35 people and I don't want, I can't, it's, it's, I can't see more. It would be unfair to them. It'd be unfair to me. And we were almost bordering on unethical it would just would be too much it would just be too much but how you find a therapist today you know i get i don't it's tough it's really do, tough do, do your research do your research and you know ideally it's like finding an aa meeting you got to go to about five or six aa meetings or al-anon meetings before you find one that feels good you ideally should interview a few different therapists to see if you connect with them. If you don't connect with them, it doesn't matter how great they are. If you don't connect with them and they don't get you and you don't get them because this is a collaboration, this isn't like they know everything, you know nothing. I mean, you're the expert in your own life, they're not. If you if the, they weren't sitting there, I'd be talking to myself, which I do anyway, but you know, it would be even worse. So it's just, it's, it's very, you know, the one thing that my husband calls what I do performative therapy. He goes, you know, I hear you laughing in the other room, even though the doors are closed. <laughs> I'm working from home in my office at home. And I say, well, you know, <laughs> I may be unorthodox. He had a shirt made for me that says not everyone's cup of tea, which is <laughs> true. But I do leave them laughing. And, you know, they keep coming back. So I get, see, I thought not slanting was a comedy. Oh, my God. Who knew? Who knew? You know, and something I didn't know until uh, the relationship I'm in now is laughter is truly the best medicine. Oh Forget it. Shoot. Did I just lose you? Nope. I'm here. Okay, wait a minute. My screen just went kablooey. Hold on one second. You just probably have to get the browser back up on screen. Okay. There we are. There we are. I had a facelift during that blackout. <laughs> so I know what you don't recognize me, but it's still me. What is the focus of your practice? Besides laughter? 
Yes. <laughs> um, I specialize in eating disorders because when I was at Brandeis, I was assigned to the woman who ran the eating disorder component at the counseling center because none of the seasoned psychologists wanted to work with that population because it's, it's, it's a very entrenched disorder and it's, it's, it's hard to deal with. So I specialize in that because she trained me so well for 10 years that she's still a really good friend that um, that's what I specialize in. But I'd say that's maybe a third to a half of my practice and the rest are just garden variety and erotics. <laughs> we, we all have a little bit of that. What do you think some of the biggest challenges you know you look at all all of what's happening in the world you know with the gun violence and just anger what do you think you know what's your take on the the state of our mental health as a country or nation well i we've already touched upon the anxiety thing particularly among um adolescent yeah, girls yeah. and depression suicidality is definitely up i don't know the statistics offhand but they're pretty frightening um i've had two people attempt suicide in the past uh, few months, maybe six months, fortunately not completing the act. Um, it's, it's, people seem sicker. I'm talking mostly about young people, not, I don't see that many people over 40. I mean, I have a few outliers who are older, but um, you know, the violence thing, I mean, uh, I, uh, I don't know. I, 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 it's very hard to usher these kids into the world and feel that we're preparing them adequately because we don't know how to be. I just got a thing today in the mail. They have these seminars, right, that you get invited to for your continuing education credits or whatever. And I said to my husband today, because this thing came about um, gun violence and guns in the classroom or and I said, okay, if anyone had said 10 years ago that you'd be getting this type of material, you, you well, would have said that's forget, forget it. Yeah. And, th and that, you know, that's, I, I keep thinking about every time I see this on the news of, of the latest school shooting, you know, when you and I went to school, we had fire drills that we used to joke around and you'd be out. I had the nuns, the nuns, they weren't beating you up, darling. You didn't go to Catholic school. The no. nuns were beating me up. That was the worst thing that happened to me. Uh, the anxiety, I can only imagine that that those drills, you know, it, and maybe it's not presenting as anxiety today, but I can't imagine that it won't present as anxiety in 10, 20 years from yes. having to hide under your desk. Right. Even if you weren't a victim by proximity to a school shooting, my son called my son is six, four, two fifty. He looks like a tight end. He calls oh my God, he is, he is so tall. Well, he was tall when he was on Knott's Landing. Where is he here? His pictures of himself. So he was on Knott's Landing for five years. It was brilliant casting. Brilliant. <laughs> well, anyway, he calls this Monday morning a few weeks ago crying. He goes, you haven't seen the news. It was, it was this Covenant School shooting in Nashville. So he lives in Nashville. He used to be in the music business. He started Jay-Z's company, uh, Rock Nation. Now he's in a different career. He's driving to pick up his two-year-old at his preschool, which is a block and a half from the Covenant School. And while he's on the phone with us, and we don't know what's happened, we hear the sirens, and my son is crying. I mean, he's a big guy. He's crying because he's watching parents running to the oh. church where everyone is gathered to pick up their children, not knowing if one of those three children or six victims, we didn't know whether they were children or adults, was one of their kids. And one of his colleagues who had just lost his wife three weeks prior had two kids in that school. And he's rushing to the school, not knowing for a while right. at least, whether this is real. Like my stomach is actually getting a little. Yeah, and, the, and that anxiety of uh, being a parent today, I, that's another thing to me. Like, I don't know how you send your child off to school. Like that really, you know. I just lost the audio. Now, why did I lose your audio? Darn, darn, darn. You what can't happened? hear me? Where did you go? Shoot, shoot, shoot. I don't know. Oh, phooey. I can't hear you. I don't know why. Um, the vagaries of... Can you restart? Text me what I should do because I can't hear you. I don't have your number. Hold on. Private chat. Mm -hmm. 
Do you see the, hold on. <laughs> Let's see. Can you see this? Oh, I can't see. Uh, sign in again. Okay, bye. Let's try that. <laughs> Technology. Hey, everybody. Um, she is fabulous. Oh, what is that? Spacebar? Oh, Clifford. I didn't know. Is that the possibility that she hit the space bar and it? The thrills of live streaming. I agree, Dave Jordan. She is amazing. Thank you. I didn't know that, Clifford, if you hit the space bar. I, I'm sorry I didn't see that. I was trying to read some other things. Uh, and yeah, she looks wonderful. She's got a great personality. Thanks, Benjamin. Hi, Lisa. Lisa, I hope ev everything is okay. Um, come on, Constance, let's get this. There she is. Can you hear me now? Can't hear you. This is so sucky. You Bummer. can't hear me? Can you hear me? Um, that? Can you hear me? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Can you hear me? Nod yes or no. no. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. So okay, I'm not right. quite sure why. Maybe we should leave him wanting more and do this another time. <laughs> You're making it very hard for me to read, Alan. I need a seeing eye dog to see your writing. Uh, private chat. Okay. That sounds vaguely obscene. Where am I going for the private chat? I'm so challenged, my dear. I have no idea what to do. Uh, hit the, hit the speaker. Space bar. Yes, not yes, not yes. It's too much no. when I worked in a group room. Okay, no, don't hit the speaker. <gasps> call me. Why don't you just call me? I'm going to call you right now. Okay, yes, call me. Is everybody enjoying watching this? <laughs> I can't turn on her audio. Um, so somebody says it might be that you touched the space bar. Space bar, okay. Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me now? Um, I can hear you on the phone, which is great. Want me um, to just put you on speaker? Want me to put you on speaker on the phone? <laughs> you could try that, see if it works. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there you go. We're not getting... You're getting feedback though. Yeah, we're getting a little feedback. Um, is it easy for you to restart your computer? Uh, I'm 76 years old. What do you think? <laughs> 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 
I made you blush, Alan. Look at you. Look at you. You're so cute. I made you blush. Um. Happened before? No, not. Is this a first? Yeah. With the no, sound. Go no, this reminds me. Seriously, this reminds me when my sister was in the group home and I had to communicate with the other residents. And this is, this is um, basically what it was like. <clears throat> did you? I no, wonder if you hit. Phone, you, obviously. It's, are you off? Are you gone? You, you're gone. No, no, no. Did you hit a mute button? No, it's, it says no. The mute button hasn't been hit. Now it's unmuted, but it was already unmuted. Can you hear me? I can only hear you here, sweetie pie. <laughs> And that lovely squeaking noise. This is when I need a tech, but you know, I have no tech except for my doodle. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know what to do. I'm so can, sorry to be so. Can you unhealthy. actually act? Actually, can you mute? Somebody about the bottom here it says having issues. Yeah, I am having issues. Let me see what it says. Having issues. I just hit having issues. Can you mute your phone? Can I do what? Mute your phone. Mute sure. yours. Okay. Okay. Now we're good. So now we can do it. Can you hear? Oh, but you can't hear me. Yes, I can. I'm, I'm on mute but I can hear you. Right, okay. There's no feedback now, so you can hear me. <laughs> Technology. Oh you know, now I know why I love show, show business. It's just too hard. <laughs> oh my God, where were we? Well, you know what I wanted I, to I dive into? I have no idea where we were. You were born in Chicago. Did you, li did you live there for a time? No. Mm -mm. I'm still getting the feedback. Do you care? Um, I've muted, but I have speaker on. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll give it a whirl. I mean, maybe maybe if you can put the phone a little away. Put it away? Okay. No, you know, like just a little behind you if you can still hear me. Okay. Because it might just be bouncing off the computer. Okay. It's a little better. Um, talk about the Howdy Doody show. How did that come about? Are we really going to go there? A little. How, um, how, did, how did you? I was having an affair with Buffalo Bob. No. I, <laughs> what difference does it make? No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's no. I was having an affair with Howdy Judy. That would even be more, you know. That would even be that more would be more. That would be more scandalous for sure. Oh, you just came back. You just came back. Okay, bye. Your voice bye. just came back. I don't know what happened, but you just came back on. That is bizarre. Okay, good. Okay, it's all your fault, Alan. Don't blame the old <laughs> fart over here in I, Boston. I have not. Um, I have not. So one of my questions was going to be, are you glad your parents uh, wanted you to have a normal childhood? But I guess not. <laughs> no, no, no. no, because if I go on the Howdy Doody show, I could have become princess summer, fall, winter, spring and become emancipated and gotten out of there. Well, my father was in the advertising business and I think one of the sponsors of the Howdy Doody show was a children's toy company like, like you know, Mattel or I, I don't know, whatever. And I did a commercial on the show. And I guess they thought, well, she's kind of cute. Doesn't say much, but she's kind of cute. Clarabelle and I did the commercial together. This is so ancient history. I, I can't know, but you know what? Just, asking me this. what oh um, one, one, of, one of the fans, Jerry, just said, Howdy Doody did it. With the phone, <laughs> with the sound. Howdy Doody, did, no. you know, Howdy Doody gave me these lines right here. This is from Howdy Doody. But don't, let's not go there. Let's not go uh, there. I know. Okay, let, not let, let's not go there. 
Take, this take is getting out. very raunchy. You know that? This is getting very raunchy. <laughs> take me back to the audition or what you remember for Laura. Now I lost your voice again. You're gone. You're gone. I just lost your voice. Fooey. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, now you're back. You're back. Yes. You just came back. It, something happened on my end that time for sure. That's right. <laughs> I, um, how did I know? So what happened was my husband was an actor at the time. I don't know if we were married. I can't remember. And he was doing a miniseries at uh, Paramount. I don't know where it was. At some studio. And uh, he came over to the casting office to shoot the breeze because he had a break. And the casting women were like in a tizzy because they were trying to find the bitchy, younger, second wife of a character in a series created by David Jacobs, not Nas Landing or Dallas. And he said, my husband, oh, my fiance would be perfect. Bitchy, yeah, bitchy, operative word. So they said, who's your fiance? He said, Constance McCash. Oh my God, she'd be great. I got the part. So I did the short-lived series for David and, uh, and I was bitchy. And then... When he created Knott's Landing, he invited me over for Christmas party, Christmas day, whatever, and he gave me the script. That was it, I never auditioned. Did you like who Laura was on paper from the beginning? He, <laughs> there wasn't a lot on paper, Alan, trust me. It was, <laughs> Laura, Laura wore a lot of pastel colors. That was basically it. And, um, which in a way, I guess is good because then I had a lot of, freedom and a lot of leeway and you know I think they were concerned because they could John Flechette had already been cast because his wife who was David Jacobs ex-wife was also David Jacobs agent so John Flechette who had just done Lee Harvey Oswald on TV successfully wonderful actor John had already been cast in that role and they had difficulty seeing John and I together although in hindsight, it was kind of like, well, Diane Keaton and the unmentionable Woody Allen. And that sort of pairing up, you know? So, in fact, I think in the long run, it made an interesting couple. But I think they were kind of having trouble picturing us together at the beginning, you know? I just saw John. John and his wife came and spent the weekend with us in the desert. And he and Bill Devane had done a play in New York called McBird when they were 23 and 20, 23 and 28, respectively. Wow. And they hadn't seen each other in about 20 years. So Bill and his wife came over. John and his wife, David Jacobs, ex-wife, were spending the weekend. We had the best time. These guys, so Dave, let me see, how old is, so John is 80 and Bill is 83. And the stories and the time in New York and working at the public theater and doing McBird. And it was just I, one of the best times I've had in a long time. It was real. I mean, the, it was so much fun, so much fun. And John is, John is wicked smart. And they're both, it would, Bill is very smart too. And they're funny. And they're mensch, they're, they're, how do you say mensch in plural? Menches? They're menches? menches yeah, I think menches, okay. yeah. They married to a Jew for 46 years, and I can't you know, should my, know that. I don't know that. So, <laughs> menches, menches, they're menches. Anyway, it was a lot of fun, and it was great to get them together, and it meant a lot to Bill, because I arranged it, and, you know, I had Lynn and John Plachette spend the weekend, and it, it was really, I did a mitzvah. You did. It, it's amazing right? that you've, I did you all have remained such good friends, and for us fans of Knott's Landing, you know, that's a beautiful thing to see because, I mean, you said you just saw Michelle in New York. Well, Michelle and I, well, my husband did a Harry, you know who Harry Chapin was? He was a singer, songwriter. Yeah, yeah. He was from Long Island originally. Yeah. He died in the he was very young. So my husband had done a review of his music at the Improv in LA directed by Bill Devane. Now, I had never met Bill. I had never met my husband. And... And then, cut to, I end up marrying my husband, 
And then Bill ends up playing my husband X years later, but I met Bill through my real husband. I mean, you live long enough, my dear. You know everything, well, you don't know everybody, but all these things, if everyone else is still alive, all connect, right? And it's it's quite, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's very gratifying, very, very gratifying. It's really, yeah, it's, I talked to Joni recently. I haven't seen her in a long time. Um, Lisa Hartman lives in Nashville, and I go to Nashville all the time, but I haven't seen Lisa. I would like to. Maybe, I, I don't know, at some point that would be nice because I'm down there so much. But it's, um, yeah, I don't know. The sad thing is all these people should still be working, but, you know, you get to a certain age and you're not considered as viable anymore, unfortunately. So it's too bad. Yeah. I, I, just I, I just had, had, had Michael Sabatino. Oh, yeah, Michael. How is Michael? Michael's great. I, I, he, was a, I, he was a cutie patootie boy when he was on the show. Yeah, I used to work with his wife uh, on Guiding Light. She was on oh, Guiding yeah? Crystal, yeah. Um, you were part of the pilot. Did you know anybody prior to filming? Joan I or Michelle or Donna? Uh, no, I didn't know anybody. I No, I didn't know anyone. The only one I knew, ironically, was Claudia Lanau, who played Michelle's daughter. daughter yeah. Because I had been in an improv group with her parents when she was 10 at the Manhattan Theater Club with her mom and her stepdad, who ended up owning the improv later. And she was just a kid. And she was just like this little 10-year-old running around. And then my husband later directed her in a play... Um, James Lapine's play table settings when she was in high school, but she was already doing not planning by then. So I, she was the only one I knew. I didn't know. Oh, 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 I knew. No, I didn't know. I met Julie. Julie and I have, we had in the same town in uh, Massachusetts, but so I got much closer to Julie because we had that connection. I hadn't known Julie before. Um, I'm trying to think if I knew any, no, I didn't, nobody, but just Claudia. That was it. Wow. That was it. And, and you, you. And Bill. I knew Bill. I knew Bill a little bit, but he came on later. You, you finished filming that pilot. Did you have any idea Knott's Landing would become the success it did? No, because the third year, I reminded Michelle of this the other day. Year three, we were almost off the docket and uh, it was kind of touch and go. And then she called me and. I think I just had a kid at that time. I think my son lady had just been born. And she said, I just want you to know that we're on the schedule. Because I, I think things were unsure. And then it went on to, you know, I don't know how many, what was it on, 14 years or something like that? So who knew? I mean, that was kind of remarkable, given the fact that it wasn't a, a, a bona fide hit, I guess, at least not perceived that way at the beginning, you know? Yeah, yeah. Was there a moment for you when you realized it was a success in your eyes or from the fan reaction or walking down the street? You know, I guess people, when they, I really, I, I know you're not going to believe this, Alan. Just fasten your seats. <laughs> I'm a very shy person. And so when I'm not talking to you, I'm very shy. So when people started to recognize me, I would get very uncomfortable, which is my problem. It's not their problem. And it was, it was usually, you know, you look like that woman, but, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Everybody tells me that, whatever. Um, that, that was, you know, that was, everybody will tell you that, though, if they're an actor and suddenly, do you know who Peter Friedman is? No, I don't think so. Okay, so Peter Friedman is, he, well, he just had an arc on Mrs. Maisel playing Freddie de Cordova on The Tonight Show, but he's also on Succession. He plays the you know, the, the, the lawyer, the, yes. the family retainer, who's yes. kind of always in the background. Yes. So we had breakfast with Peter last Saturday. And my husband said, we sit down and we're sitting outside. He goes, does anyone ever recognize you? He goes, do you see anybody coming up to me? And Peter's <laughs> been an actor forever. He goes, do you see anybody? He was on Brooklyn Bridge. He played the father on Brooklyn Bridge. At the end of breakfast, a woman comes up to the table and says, I'm sorry to bother you, Peter. <laughs> I didn't, she, she didn't even say Peter. She goes, my son, we had to come to New York on vacation because he's obsessed with succession. As a matter of fact, when we left Sacramento, he played the theme song before we left the house. <laughs> I said, how old is your son? He, she said, 31. I went, well, okay, okay. So 
her son was coming across the street. Peter jumped up, went to the intersection and greeted him and the intersection. And the son was like gobsmacked. That's it was amazing. so funny. Yep. Peter, Peter is an amazing actor, but you know, he's a theater actor. So a lot of people would know him from succession, but he hasn't had, you know, his part has been relatively small, unfortunately. And, I think I'm Mrs. Maisel. I haven't seen it yet, but I think he's got a lot to do in that six episode arc. But he's, um, yeah, he's a wonderful actor. Wonderful yeah, actor. I'm anyway, really gotta, so. I have to probably catch up on that tonight. Um, you know, thinking about your practice, it's kind of interesting that you you do have a younger generation because they would not necessarily recognize you. No, um, nobody under 60 knows not <laughs> slam. <laughs> Hey, that's not true. I'm under 60. Well, I, I, you know what I mean. I mean, I, I think know. it's, yeah. I think it's, uh, well, you didn't know who Penny Fuller was. I Penny didn't. Fuller won a Tony for applause, got nominated for another play, did, got an Emmy for The Elephant Man. I mean, she, she was, you know, she was the Jessica Chastain in terms of theater, because Jessica's doing a play right now in New York of her time. Yeah. And Penny could sing too. And she went to Northwestern and she, she, there were people in her class that went on, Dick Benjamin, Paul Apprentice. I mean, you know, but if you're not, it's just a sad commentary, that's all. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're older, which is why I'm so glad I changed careers because I certainly wouldn't be working as an actor. I just think you're just as talented as you were, maybe even you're better, but there's just no room for you, you know? unless you're English and female, you know? I mean, Maggie Smith and, and Judy Dench and um, Helen Mirren, you know, these women work, I mean, but it's a, they came out of a different system, you know? It's, uh, it's just unfortunate, but that's, I guess, that's just the way it, you know? Just the yeah, way it, 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 you, it make, As a woman in this country, you're invisible. Once you're, once you're through menopause, maybe. Nobody sees you anymore. So anyway, that's all I have to say about that. That's your, your, your soapbox for a minute. <laughs> um, that's my soapbox. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> well, I wanted to read, Ken says, Constance was the heart of Knott's Landing for me. And Laura was such a complex character who could have gone to so many places. Did you feel you were the heart of Knott's? I think she went. I, I, I think she went to heaven, didn't she? I hope so. I think she went to heaven. I think she did too. I think she did too. Did you? Uh, the women all hit it off from the get-go. You know, most of the. I'm trying to think. Actually, everyone in the show had done theater because that was what happened in those days. People came out from New York, and you saw your friends in the waiting room, and they were all theater people. Joni went to Yale Drama School right out of high school, did, did Barefoot in the Park on Broadway. Michelle, I saw Michelle in How to Succeed. When I, Michelle's only a few years older than I am, so she was very young when she did that. Um, Bill did theater, John did theater, Donna did theater. Um, I mean, really, everyone came from that world, so I think everyone had a similar mechanism, and mm. it made it made working together much easier because everyone spoke the same language. So yeah, I think it was a good, I mean, I mean, working with Julie Harris was I, I, like, one time we were shooting at the airport at LAX, we were shooting at a restaurant. It was me, Julie and Ava Gardner, the three of us. So we got the star of Broadway at that time, she'd won more Tonys than anybody. We've got this enormous screen star and we got this little, you know, Shiksa from Fairfield County, Connecticut. <laughs> and I said to the crew, I said, it doesn't get any better than this. Look at this. Look at, I mean, look what I get to do. Look who I get to work with. This is amazing. Amazing. And, it, and Julie and I became very, very close because we saw each other a lot. As I said earlier, she had a house in Chatham where they're shooting a series now with Nicole Kidman. Oh my God, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> and it'll never be the same. We will never be able to get into the local lobster roll place. <laughs> um, but Julie lived there for many, many years, which is how we ended up getting a house in Chatham as a summer weekend house because 
Julie gave us her house when my son was born, which we didn't ask for. She just said, why don't you stay at my house for a month? She was out of the country doing something for PBS. And then Ava Gardner, oh my God. I mean, come on, come on. I mean, who gets to say that Ava Gardner played their mother-in-law who hated their character, by the way? Yeah, which, was, ma which makes it more fun for you. Oh my God. <laughs> she was a piece of work and she was so, I've told this story a million times, but one morning I had a stupid fight with my son who was probably like four or something. And I slammed his bedroom door and it cracked down the middle. It's terrible. <laughs> And I get to the makeup trailer at like 4.35 in the morning and it's just Ava and I. And I'm crying. I was oh my God, I'm so upset. I slammed the door and the thing and my son, I said, oh my God, I feel so bad. And she was so sweet, so sweet to me. And that night, no cell phones. Well, except those big ass car phones, but no cell phones. The landline rings and my husband picks it up and he goes, hello. And hello, darling, is... <laughs> Constance there, it's Ava. And my husband is like. <laughs> and I take the phone and she was calling to see if I was okay. Wow. Now she was a mensch or whatever <laughs> the feminine version of a mensch is. That's she was a real, she had great stories. She was a pro. She was so good. And she and Bill were great. And the just... That was, that was exciting. And also Don Murray, when Don Murray was on the show, that was exciting, except he unfortunately, you know, left after a couple of years. But working with Don, oh, shoot, 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 shoot. Why do you keep disappearing on me? I don't know. You're, I think you've oh, got some ghosts. God. Do you have some ghosts? Yeah, well, there? This, house is, this house is very old. It could be. <laughs> um, by the way, we bought this house from david mamet the playwright oh wow yeah that's a whole episode that's another episode that's <laughs> another episode anyway right. um don murray i must as the good catholic girl i was i much i must have watched the hoodlum priest the movie the hoodlum priest god knows how many times and when i met don murray not to mention bus stop with marilyn monroe oh my god he was so sweet such a sweet man such a dear dear man Anyway, I was very blessed. I've gotten to meet some incredible people, work with some incredible people. I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky, really, really lucky. You well, know, we, we, really. we were really lucky to watch all of you. And I know the fans, all of them keep writing. Everybody keeps asking. I've been asking, when is that show going to be streamed somewhere for people to watch? I don't know. I have, I don't know the, mechanics of that happening or why it doesn't happen i mean i i don't i really don't know i have no idea my you know yeah i don't know maybe um, they have to read maybe they have to retitle it the land of the dinosaurs <gasps> oh i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding so i'm a dinosaur too we're all dinosaurs <laughs> not you you're not a dinosaur but i'm i'm getting you know. there i'm getting there talk to me about the the lie episode in the first season which was quite controversial when Laura was raped. Do you remember when they told you that was going to happen to her? Your, you know, your immediate thoughts? I don't remember the, um, the actual becoming aware of the episode. The woman that was the customer on set, fortunately, I, I had never been raped. I certainly had been in some compromising situations that I probably didn't want to be in as a female, as a young female. And um, subsequently, subsequently, people very close to me, unfortunately, have been raped. But this young woman, and she was very young, her name was Marty. She was so nice. She was so sweet. Probably a little younger than I was. And that had happened to her. And she was very um, attuned to the whole scenario, the process. She was enormously sensitive to the acting part of it, you know, and how, what's the word? Not delicate, that's not really the right word, but how, how, I, how it had to be handled from my standpoint, probably more than 
the writers would have realized because she unfortunately had experienced something like that. And, um, you know, there's an adage, you don't have to be a murderer to play a murderer in as an actor. Mm -hmm. You can use things in your, your own life as substitutions. But I just remember her so well because she was just very, um, I don't know, she, she just was enormously helpful in not just because she was on set. It was, it was so much more than that, you know. That's what I remember more clearly than anything else. Actually. Well, it, it, it must have brought a real sense of reality to it, too, you know, telling, almost telling. Yeah, and of course, we're, we're talking. Her story, almost we're, telling her story. Right. We're talking 40 years ago, right? Yeah. 40, no, more than that. We, it's a long time ago. Yeah. When women reporting, and unfortunately, just like going to therapy, if you've been raped or sexually molested or assaulted, you question whether you should report it because you're going to have to relive it and you're going to be interrogated and you're going to be doubted and it's going to ruin someone's life besides having already ruined your life. Um, and it's many women don't, they don't, you know, if, if one in four women are raped, usually by somebody they know, they're not all reporting that. And you I, know? I, I think that's still as true today as it was. I when think it's... it is definitely true. Definitely yeah. true. I mean, I hope. And, you know, and also, I mean, there's male on male rape, female on female, female on male. I mean, it's not just, you know, men raping women. So I think that, God, we're archaic in the way we see things. It's really ridiculous when you think about it, about therapy, about sexual assault, about. Yeah, yeah, I. I it's just you, you must have heard from fans too afterwards about, you know, their experiences. They must have been writing in. You know, I don't know. We didn't have the technology we have today. So in terms of people reaching out to you, I mean, I still get letters here at home, but in terms of. Yeah. Not, uh, not anybody, as, not as instant today. Not as, not as, and not as direct perhaps, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, talk about being let go from a job you a job you loved because they had to have budget cuts. That had to be a big slap in the face. And the pocketbook, yeah. <laughs> More so the pocketbook than the face. Hey, if I could make the money that I made then doing what I do now, I would be, I, that would, that would just be amazing. Amazing. Um, I never saw and, it coming. And so in your mind, should you as the work you're doing now be paid more? No, no, no. I, I do very well. I'm, I'm not complaining. About no, no, that. no. Just, but you know what I, I made mean? more money as an actress, but no. Right. But I'm, I'm, you know, it, it's sort of actors are paid more than teachers, more than therapists. I'm just saying, you know, do you, you know, is it, I think you deserve more as a therapist. Yeah, but only 10% of the union makes that kind of money. So therapists mm -hmm. all make about the same. So it's not as if the Got numbers you. are, you know, imbalanced in terms of the field. So it's, it's really unfair to compare the two. But anyway, ask me that question again that you just asked me. <laughs> About the money? No, did I like having a brain tumor? Is that what you were going to ask me? No, I did not. <laughs> no, you were asking me about leaving the show or something like that. I as I said, um, when they let you go for budget cuts, what would you know? Yes. Talk about you know what that was like at that time, leaving a job you loved. What do you think? Sucked. Yeah, it was really. I didn't see it coming, John. Plachette, who obviously was also let go for whatever reasons earlier on, he asked me that question. We went out to get stuff for dinner because he's an amazing chef, by the way. And he was making dinner for all of us. And he said, he asked me a similar question. And, you know, I don't even remember what I said. I mean, I didn't see it come. I mean, I just had a baby. I was about to have a baby. I can't remember the timeline. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was, it, we had just started building a house in Beverly Hills. That was not a good look. 
And fortunately, my husband was doing very well, but still, it was just, you know, it was a surprise. It was just a surprise. I didn't let like, Julie go, and they let, who else, Doug Sheehan, and Alec was let go shortly before that, I guess. But, you know, yeah. And it's not like I was making the biggest salary on the show. So I guess they had to fire four people to equal one. I don't know what they had to do, but whatever. I guess they had to save money and, you know, I hope it worked out in their favor. <clears throat> well, you walked away with some beautiful friendships, that's for sure. Yeah, and I felt really good about the work I did. And, you know, it was only about 10, not even 10 years of my life. So it's not, I mean, when you look at it over this span of a lifetime it's not you know proportionally it's not that big a period of time but obviously it had the most impact in terms of my uh, acting career right well so. and and you think of everybody who's tuning in today because I'm wondering wondering why the sound got so fucked up <laughs> they're they, they I, i'm reading comments they have loved every story Grant loved your contributions to all the series you did, movies and game shows. Jeanette says, I'm 53. Oh, game I shows. Yes, I was the game show queen. Yes. <laughs> did you yes. did you have a favorite? You know what? That's a funny story. No, we I'm sorry. No, no, that's about. okay. Go ahead. What were we yeah, going to say? Go. We went into the whole cast went into Spago one night. It's a great photo somewhere. I don't know where it is. So we all go to Spago, which was this shishi restaurant in Hollywood. West Hollywood or Beverly Hills. Even know. I've been there. Where it was. It's gone now. <laughs> All right. So we go in there and the hostess says to me, you can't really see what I'm going to do when I'm going to make myself a little higher. She goes, oh my God, you gave me these. I went, whoa, whoa, what? what? <laughs> evidently, evidently she was on the pyramid, one of the pyramid shows, 25,000, whatever pyramid. And I won her a shitload of money and she had her tits done. <laughs> that? And she thanked me. That is so see? The, see the ripple effect of best story on a nighttime soap. <laughs> best story ever. Um, Jeanette said, I'm 53 and remember Knott's Landing, but I also remember a TV movie you did with Lindsay Wagner and Linda Gray. Do you remember the name of that? I did two movies with Lindsay. I'm most, always the best friend. Always the best friend. I was Lindsay's best friend in... Um, Oh God, what was it called? The something of Jenny Logan. Oh yes. And then I was her good friend in with, uh, uh, oh God, what's her name? Uh, oh shoot, shoot, shoot. I can't think of the other actress. It's terrible. Oh my God. In something called Nightmare at Bitter Creek about these three women that go on a camping trip. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, it's not funny. And they're terrorized by survivalists. This is of course, something that I'm perfectly cut out for. And um, yeah, so that was, I did two things with Lindsay. The, yeah. I, I probably saw them both because uh, both names sound so familiar. Um, one of the yeah. fans was asking, was it your idea to have the pregnancies of Daniel and Meg written into the show? Uh, Dan, um, I didn't tell them I was pregnant and for a few months. Although the, the, the wardrobe, head of wardrobe seemed to notice when we went shopping. that I was <laughs> But um, when I did tell them, they were, no, they were great. I mean, because, you know, it's been hidden, obviously, in some series, but they incorporated into the show. And then, like I said earlier, Daniel was on the show for almost like five years. It was great. And then the second pregnancy, because I didn't know I was going to be, you know, meeting my maker, I, that was just written in with the idea that my imminent death was going to be even more heartbreaking after I died and left this little, this little ginger haired baby with Bill Devane. You know? Absolutely. Did Daniel ever consider following in mom's footsteps as an actor afterwards? No, no, no. He smartened up and he went into the music business. <laughs> <laughs> But he did really well. He did really well. He 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 discovered Wale, who's a great rapper. He discovered uh, Mike Posner, who was very successful, who wrote his first hit in his college room at Duke. He discovered uh, Capital Cities. He discovered he did really really well. And then I think he just and then he moved to Nashville. He and his wife, and then he's in a totally different career now. Totally different, and very happy. 
Hey, that's all. That's what you want, right? So, no, he never thought of being a cat. Sorry, say it again. That's what you want. You want, you know, to enjoy what you're doing. Oh, I, yeah, I'm so lucky. Both my kids are married, terrific people. And they're really, to just, yeah. I mean, that's what Larry Moss said to me at lunch on Sunday. He goes, Con, my good friends call me Con, Alan. You may call me Con. Okay. He said, you, you had this, this great career. You know, you've had two careers that you love. You've been married for 45 years. Yeah, 45 years, my God. And um, you have these two wonderful kids who have met amazing people. I mean, I, their partners are just wonderful. I mean, I'm, what, what, what could I ask for? Nothing, nothing, absolutely not. And I live in David Mamet's old house. Oh my God. So what else could that, I possibly that's ask? That's pretty for? good. Do you have grandchildren? I have a, uh, a daughter. My son has a daughter that he didn't realize he had from when he was in college. She's about to go to UT Austin. Oh, wow. And then he has a new baby who's three months old, a little boy named Boston. Oh, and that then is he has such son, a great name. He has a son who's two years old named Hardy. Harding or Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y. And um, my daughter has a pit bull. <laughs> uh, what, is, uh, what does it feel like having grandkids? I never thought I'd be, I, I, I never thought I'd be a grandmother. I never wanted to be, a, I didn't even want to get married and have children anyway. So being a grandmother, I, you know, some people are insufferable about their grandchildren, insufferable. <laughs> and I just thought I'm going to be the mean granny or the bad granny, but you know, they sort of win you over and actually they're pretty cool. And you know, they, it's not they so do, bad. They do win you over. Jacob said, I loved your work with Lisa Hartman on Knots. Laura was always a trailblazer in prime time from balancing work and marriage and being a single mom. And because, every uh, Lee, because Lisa and I supposedly had a lesbian relationship. <laughs> you know that, right? I mean, not Lisa and I. I meant the characters, CG. the two characters. CG. It was, it was intimated. CG or it Kathy. As a matter of fact, I think. Like, right? One of them, I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> because one time, one time when John Pichette came in for an entrance, we did something for the gag reel. We put mustaches on, Lisa and I, and <laughs> oh my God, that's so stupid. And we were like, you know, making out or something when he came in and then we whipped around and it took a lot to make John break up. Trust me. I mean, he was like, he's, he's an actor's actor. And we turned around and he just lost it, lost it. It was so funny. It was so funny. It was great. Anyway. I, I bet you had the time of your life because you you are a Spitfire con. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first person who's called me that. So can't so now you see God. And she had to act all that sturm and drang on that nighttime soap. And she was never allowed to be funny. Well, sometimes she could be funny. And and you realize that was real acting. <laughs> that was real acting well you made us fall in love with uh laura and yourself so oh what a alan alan that's such a sweet thing to say thank you that's so nice that's so nice well that's thank you for spending thing. the time with us today my it pleasure really a pleasure to meet you i i'm gonna okay. come knocking at david mammoth's door sometime <laughs> I can hardly wait. You'll be trick-or-treating. Why don't you come trick-or-treating? Okay, I will with mustache. Thank you. I'm sorry for that glitch, whatever it was, but I think it Whatever it out. was. The, the ghost of David's house. All right, right. You have a wonderful right. weekend. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Please join me on Wednesday, May 17th, for another Ryan's Hope reunion featuring Rosa Leo. Richard Backus, Karen Gowdy, and Gordon Thompson. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, do so down below. I hope you liked today's episode and click the like button and uh, turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And don't forget, you can stream The Locker Room on your favorite streaming platform. I hope you all have a great weekend. Please stay safe and I will see you next Wednesday. Bye, everybody. <laughs>